Star Wars 7x7 episode 2962. Today is the first part of my conversation with Dr. Chris Kempshaw, the author of The History and Politics of Star Wars. And lest you think that a conversation about the history and politics of Star Wars would be dry, let me assure you that the only thing that's dry about this conversation is Chris Kempshaw's wit. Punch it. <laughs> Hey Rebel Rouser, I'm Alan Voivod and this is Star Wars 7x7, your daily dose of Star Wars joy. And thank you so much for joining me for it. So here is the official bio for Chris. He's a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Exeter and a senior research fellow at the Center for Army Leadership, Royal Military Academy Sandhurst. He is a historian of the First World War as well as popular representations of history in modern media. He has authored numerous academic works including the First World War in computer games and British, French, and American American relations on the Western Front 1914 to 1918. And as I said at the top, not only does he have a very dry wit, as with the second Death Star in Return of the Jedi, it was fully armed and operational by the time our conversation began just a couple of days ago. So just to give you an idea of what's to come, these are some of the topics that we explored in the first half of the conversation. First of all, drawing the line for him writing the book, considering that all <laughs> this new material for Star Wars is coming out and you know where do you stop? Also the depictions of the Empire and the First Order and how that's changed and whether it will get more complex over time as Disney continues to dig into the new canon. The notion of a pop historian and what a pop understanding of history might look like and how that fits into George Lucas's own conception of Star Wars and history. An axis of illustrative versus instructive examples of democracy and totalitarianism. The post-Soviet era and the changing nature of villains in the expanded universe. The concepts of democracy and fascism as ideas as opposed to actions in Star Wars. How Star Wars has gone from being retrospective to current to prescient in terms of its political outlook and storytelling, and how the expanded universe brought a richer historical perspective to Star Wars storytelling, both with the addition of writers with a wider range of viewpoints, but also with a wider range of generational experiences and cultural touchstones. And that's just the first half of the conversation, so without further ado, let's get into it. Here is the first half of my conversation with Dr. Chris Kemschel, author of, among other things, things, the history and politics of Star Wars. Chris Kempshaw, thank you so much for joining me on Star Wars 7x7. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you very much for having me having me along. I've been really looking forward to this. Oh, me too. Me too. Uh, yes, I'm very excited that you're here. I'm so happy to have gotten to read The History and Politics of Star Wars. This is your new book, and it is intense, and I mean that in the best way. It is a very thorough researching and elaboration on so many societal and cultural and historical and political and also moral topics within the Star Wars universe and not just in the cinematic over but also across the entirety of the expanded universe and looking at the Legends canon versus the new Disney canon. It's just, it's a stunning piece of work and I'm so thrilled to be able to talk with you about it. I'm really pleased that you enjoyed it. I, you know, you slave over it for five years and there's that kind of fear that you release it into the world and everyone's going to read it and go, this is garbage. Um, have, <laughs> you don't, do you even know anything about Star Wars or anything like that? So the, the, the fact that that hasn't happened immediately kind of puts me at ease a little bit. <laughs> well, since you say that you've been working on it for the last five years, I, I guess I have to ask, have you been madly revising over the course of that time as new Disney Star Wars material has been released. Yes. Um, <laughs> part of the reason why it's taken five years. I mean, when I signed the contract, the sequel trilogy hadn't, hadn't finished yet. So ah, yeah. I was kind of like, well, we can't release this until, because if, you know, you know, I've got an idea of how the, the plots of these films are going, but if Disney then, you know, pull a weird rabbit out of a hat for the last one and completely change everything, this, mm -hmm. this book is going to age on the, on the bookshelves of, of, of <laughs> of like random shops and the like um and then if you think about um the release schedule for what turned out to be the rise of skywalker it changed like three times so we yes. kept having to push the book back and back and back and then ah. you know, there was a pandemic and then they kept releasing new stuff which was you know it's great for being a star wars fan but there's also an element of i mean cut me cut me some slack guys honestly i'm trying to <laughs> i'm trying to finish a thing here you can't keep releasing new material at some point i'm gonna have to draw a line in the sand <laughs> 
Well, like, I guess it helps. And I'm kind of going sideways into this comparatively from where I thought I was going to go into it. But um, maybe it helps a little bit with the Disney Star Wars canon. One of the things that you talk about in the book is the depiction of the the bad guys, whether it's the Empire, or whether it's the First Order, um, leaving the Sith out of it for the time being. But one of the things that you had suggested at the time uh, in, in the book was that the depiction of the Empire definitely evolves over the course of 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s with the expanded universe and whatnot, but it kind of simplifies comparatively under the Disney Star Wars canon to some degree. And I don't necessarily mean that in a, in a bad way or a critical way or anything like that. In fact, actually, I'm wondering whether you might look at that and say, well, it's just because they're just getting started and they rebooted everything and whether you think that maybe it'll get more complex over time. Um, it might do. What I think has, has kind of happened with both the, the Empire and the First Order is probably a kind of a, a symptom, if you like, of the you know Lucasfilm story group and Lucasfilm in, in, in general, knowing exactly what they want mm -hmm. with it and exactly what they want from it. Um, and, you know, they have honed in on particular kind of aspects of, you know, Nazi Germany and like heavily for the, 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 the First Order and... Um, the Empire. I mean, you know, there's the interview with J.J. Abrams in the lead up to The Force Awakens, where he says that their inspiration for the First Order was, you know, what if the Nazis had all got together in Argentina and then reappeared in like 20 or 30 years later? Yes. You know, what would it yes. look like? That mm -hmm. and, and you can see that kind of direct historical kind of inspiration in it. But what's interesting, I think, about um, the Empire in particular under Disney, and this is this is an element that you know, Disney have that they can kind of play around in a, in a, in a brand new world because of, you know, the, the decanonization of the expanded universe and the like, is that we never really actually got an awful lot of stuff in the old expanded universe about what it was like living under the Empire. Um, mm. You know, a load of the expanded universe books come post Endor, um, post Return of the Jedi. We never actually got a huge amount of kind of, you know, Emperor and Vader at their heyday. And what you get from Disney and things like Rebels and like is, you know, what does it look like to live day to day in a world under imperial occupation? And by producing those circumstances, they can just go shopping through kind of like moments in history. You know, they can go directly to Nazi Germany. They can go directly to Stalin's Soviet Union. They can, you know, basically cherry pick their oppressive vision of, you know, life in the galaxy under the empire from whichever kind of historical dictatorship they want on any given day of the week. And that allows them to populate that world in a way that maybe the expanded universe never really got to because everything had to come after the empire. Right, exactly, because Lucas was saying, you know, fencing off this particular area of time because he had other storytelling that he wanted to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to circle you back to something that you talk about kind of early in the book, and I think it's useful to kind of frame the conversation to some degree. Uh, it's the notion of a pop historian. So, you know, there are historian historians, and then, um, and I'm not sure if you directly referred to George Lucas as a pop historian, but basically I think that's the implication that you give. And so I wonder if you would kind of define your idea of a pop historian. That's a really, really good question. And yeah, I don't know if I if I quite define, end up defining George Lucas as a pop historian, but saying that he deals with a pop history version of, of, of history, which is, I mean, the starting point is, and I think this is probably the starting point almost in the introduction, is that George Lucas is not a historian um, <laughs> and doesn't have to act like one. You know, he doesn't have to go out and go, you know, here's my film and here's a bunch of footnotes so you can understand what's going on. That's not his job. He's he's a film director. He's making He's making entertainment. But what you end up with is the difference between what I would call kind of historian historian or, or kind of academic historian and pop history is uh, effectively like pop history kind of leans towards a, a, a general feeling or understanding of what the past was like. So um, without kind of, you know, necessarily going, you know, digging in again into footnotes or lots and lots of kind of books and stuff like that. It's it's if you talk to people about the Second World War, for an example, as, as a thing. The Second World War exists in English kind of society as much in the same way as I imagine it exists in American society. And people will have an understanding about the Second World War that doesn't necessarily come from reading books about the Second World War. It right. comes from culture. It comes from popular understandings. It comes from media. Um, and what you end up with, therefore, is, you know, lots of different versions of the Second World War that all share some of the same traits, but may, you know, 
differ on accuracy or differ on emphasis and the like. And what you see in particularly through George Lucas and some of the kind of the material of the Star Wars universe when it's drawing on history is is that it's it's a vision of history that isn't necessarily informed by historians, but is informed by culture. You can understand it and it's recognizable because, you know, we've all watched the Second World War film and, you know, you can pick it apart with accuracy and authenticity as much as you want to, but that's quite boring. You know, it <laughs> delivered a vision of the Second World War that the directors and the actors and the audience all shared and understood. Um, and that's what you kind of get from pop history. It's a history that we all share. You know, the pop of pop history stands for popular, um, mm -hmm. you know, in the, in the sense that, you know, it's a public shared understanding of history. And that's the interesting thing about what you get in, in Star Wars, because it isn't always, you know, 100% accurate, authentic, you know, hard bitten footnoted history. <laughs> but it's a recognizable understanding of the past. You can see where it's come from. Yeah, and it is come kind of full circle in its way because Star Wars now, as it exists in the culture, I think a lot of people walk around with a popular understanding of Star Wars as well. And, you know, yes, like the Empire is villainous. So you could also, you know, you end up applying the Empire as a notion to other things in our world. And it becomes this you know, cycle that kind of rhymes, as George Lucas likes to say, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but it's also interesting, you know, I, I, I kind of have done various bits of teaching with students at universities at, you know, various ages down to like school kids and the like. And it's interesting when you talk to them about Star Wars, how many of them haven't seen Star Wars, but know that Darth Vader was Luke Skywalker's father. Because oh, yeah. culture provides that information to us. We don't need to go and watch Star Wars to, to gather that information. Right. And the same thing happens with kind of historical understandings. So there's kind of an axis that I, I felt like kind of begin to coalesce as I was reading about um, both your you know, descriptions about the empire and also then about looking at republics. And it feels like the stuff that we see about, about the empire, about the villains is more illustrative. Like it's actually kind of showing us an idea of what fascism, of what totalitarianism yeah. looks like. Whereas the republic is almost depicted as instructive. So it's yes. like, there's this kind of, you know, this spectrum of, well, is it just illustrating what this is or is it instructive? And in particular, then when you look at the Republic, we're seeing depictions of democracy in particular and of its you know, failings and foibles and its vulnerabilities. Yeah, no, I would absolutely agree with that in that, you know, when you look at both the old Republic and the new Republic, it's it's kind of like, you know, are you looking to set yourself up with a democratic system? Do you want a what not to do guide? Have all of these books and films because this will be a dystopian nightmare. Um, <laughs> And it's 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 impressive to the extent that you know democracy just doesn't work in 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 the Star Wars world. It never works. Republics are always useless and bureaucratic and tied down in red tape and all of those things. But it's acting like a like a almost like a public information <laughs> to kind of show you like this is this is what it looks like when it doesn't work. Um, whereas you're right in that the 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 Empire exists in a in a kind of a, a descriptive, kind of slightly more flexible uh, um, space. Whereas, you know, the, the portrayal of the Republic, new, old or new, stays relatively steady because it doesn't work and that's all you need to really, really put across. Whereas the Empire kind of evolves kind of Hydra-esque with multiple mm -hmm. heads to fit whatever hat you need to put on it on any given day of the week. Yeah, that I found was particularly fascinating as you talked about in particular the Soviet Union, which then of course merges or uh, not merges, but just develops into Russia to, you know, a quote unquote friendly Russian state to, you know, something <laughs> less friendly and how the depictions of villains within the Star Wars universe can kind of draw on the template of our evolving understanding of um, our Western relationship with Russia and that being a primary factor for, um, for using as a template for understanding what kind of villain we're looking at in the expanded universe in particular. Yeah, yeah, I I genuinely, one of the things that what I wanted to do with this book that kind of motivated me was that 1990s period, you know, post fall of the Soviet Union, you know, the heyday really of the expanded universe before mm -hmm. kind of like you move into like a more cohesive New Jedi Order time period and the like when you've got all of these various books and games and that mm -hmm. coming out. And what was interesting when going back to look at it was I kind of I went back to it again with like a feeling of I'm pretty sure that I'm going to find certain things when I start looking at these again. Mm -hmm. But it was 
amazing the the sheer extent to which looking at those books of the 1990s are all kind of shot through with this post-soviet not quite sure how to deal with the world um this fear about what will happen with like ultra nationalists in the empire you know mirroring up with the fear about ultra nationalists in in post-soviet russia but it's also you know mirroring a load of films that came out at exactly the same time it's clearly kind of tapping into some kind of cultural tension um and you know if your listeners have, you know, have seen the film air force one or um the hunt for red october admittedly you know the hunt for red october was written you know as a, as a novel that came out um before the the fall of the soviet union um but you see that kind of that uh, oh, ultra nationalist Eastern European Russian type with nuclear warhead, mm-hmm. just constantly in Hollywood action films in the in the mid nineteen nineties. At yes. exactly the same time as you're getting um, ultra zealot, idealistic, ideologue imperial admiral with super weapon in a, in a in an expanded universe book at exactly the same time, and they're they're all speaking to this kind of what does victory look like. Is this mm-hmm. is it does this mean that we've won? Is this what is this the world that we now get to, to, to exist in? Is, is this is this what it was all for? Kind of tension within Star Wars, but also within within our own world. Absolutely. And you also kind of you touch on something too that I um that I just found fascinating in the book, which is that the the timeline of Star Wars storytelling seems to go from looking back at the past to being very contemporary to almost being prescient in some degree and it's really bizarre how that happens so with you know lucas looking at the original trilogy the vietnam war obviously very greatly affected his understanding of of the world and of politics and of history and that's what he was conveying but then with the you know the initial uh, forays of the expanded universe you get stuff dealing with the fall of the soviet union and that whole post-soviet era but then when you get to the prequel trilogy and talk about democracy falling and also in the expanded universe and i always watch the pronunciation of this with the yuzan vong you know maybe yeah <laughs> um and yeah, that seems close enough yeah <laughs> thank you and there being you know potential parallels to al-qaeda and that sort of um taliban like uh, militant um religious feeling you know, then we get to a place where you know story storytelling is almost prescient in a degree but would you say that lucas in going back to the prequel trilogy is he still more or less affected by what's happening or you know, what happened with the vietnam war even though he is naming like newt gunray after newt gingrich and um lot dot <laughs> after senator trent lot so like there's contemporary stuff but it still seems like he's very much pulling from his prior influences yeah i think i think he is the george lucas's default setting seems to be you know control alt delete restore to vietnam um <laughs> you know uh, dot, et, dot exe or something along those lines um <laughs> But um, <laughs> um, um, I, one of the issues with George Lucas is that George Lucas is not necessarily the best source on what George Lucas is thinking. Um, That's George a Lucas fascinating a line. In, things. Oh, yeah. I love that you say that in the book, too. That's awesome. Yeah, because it's there's no other way of saying it. You know, George Lucas says a lot of stuff. And, you know, one of the jobs of a historian at times is to try and, or anyone analyze, analyzing it, is to try and, you know, draw what you think the key threads in this out of, out of it are. And George Lucas says repeatedly that with the prequel films, he is not trying to, you know, critique or do bits and pieces about, you know, George W. Bush and the war on terror and Iraq and Afghanistan. And he says, you know, like, oh, you know, there are definite similarities and like, but, you know, I'm I'm trying to deal with something that, that is effectively t- timeless. And the thing about that is, I just don't believe him. I just <laughs> don't. Um, I don't believe that. And, you know, I, I, there's a there's a quote from another author in the book where he refers to George Lu- Lucas as being like a fuzzy brained liberal, that mm-hmm. he is not drawing on the world that is happening at the time, because that's what George Lucas does. Um, right. You know, for someone who is, you know, terrified by the spectre of Richard Nixon and you know who amongst us has not woken up in the middle of the night terrified by the spectre of Richard Nixon. I mean really <laughs> um, yeah um, check under the bed uh, for all of your listeners before you, go to sleep tonight. <laughs> you never you never know what might be lurking there um but you know when George Lucas is pointing out you know oh you know there are all of these weird echoes and this stuff that happened previously was happening now 
I just don't believe that he isn't putting it in the films. I and and you know him and Dave Filoni to an extent say when they're making the Clone Wars. Oh, you know, we, you know me and George might talk about the politics of that's going on at the moment, but you know we're not we're not looking to make a political thing and put the the current situation in. And I don't believe them when they say that either. Um, <laughs> you know, in in an episode of the Clone Wars, they have like. A massive thing about the the ongoing financial crash with with banks you know lending money at outrageous interest rates um yes. there's a whole bit where um mace windu anakin and obi-wan basically waterboard cad bane um yes. to get him to to give them information about i just you know they can say that they're not putting the politics in there and they know I, I, we, we should have noticed there are probably a variety of reasons why they're saying they're not putting the politics in there. Yes. But that doesn't mean that I believe them. And I think, you know, or I certainly hope that, you know, the points where I'm pointing out in the analysis about why I might not believe them kind of, at the very least, seem reasonably convincing to the author or to the, to the audience. Oh, yeah. And there's there's one interview snippet that you have in there from Lucas where um, he says that, you know, he puts these sort of conundrums in all of his movies, uh, which then, you know, would extend to the Clone Wars as well, of course, just that he kind of wants to put these out there for discussion, but he, you know, says he wants people to think it through for themselves. But I, I imagine that he probably has a conclusion that he would certainly like people to arrive at. <laughs> yeah. You know, George Lucas isn't, you know, he hasn't kind of, you know, wrapped on Revenge of the Sith and he's played all three films back, you know, in, in a line to get with each other and sat back in his chair in his in his home theater and go, wow, I really hope that that's an incredibly ambivalent description of failing <laughs> democracy <laughs> and that the audience will draw their own conclusions. Um, you know, he, he wants people to walk out of the cinema going, I recognize certain aspects of that plot in a galaxy far far away in a real world that looks like ours so um that leads me to kind of maybe put you on the spot a little bit because as i'm reading this book and in particular the section about the republic and about democracies you know one wants to arrive at a broader conclusion of well if we see these constant depictions of democracy failing what does that mean? Like, what is and what does an ideal democracy look like? Um, you know, and it's own, and it's a question that I found myself like wanting to ask you as I was reading it because, you know, you know, and part of it, as you say, and very helpfully, is that the failing of democracy and the issues that they use to undermine democracy are also largely narrative devices to a degree. Like, you need to create conflict in some fashion in order for there to be a compelling story to yeah. tell. So naturally, we're going to see failing democracies because otherwise, you know, shiny, happy people doesn't necessarily make for riveting storytelling, <laughs> right? But um, yeah, 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 yeah. so where is the balance, at least, you know, in your particular opinion, between the, you know, strong, you know, centralized situation versus the, um, you know, the diverse <laughs> representative kind of republic situation? That is a really, really good question. And, and you're right, first, before I get into those details, to flag up that narrative element for it, because, you know, that is the thing that undercuts it. No one wants to go and read a book or play a game or watch a film where, you know, oh, my God, there's this awful, terrible existential threat but don't worry the government smoothly and calmly leapt into action solved it, it and we can all you know go about our business that's right. oh great that that sounds exciting um <laughs> but what i would say is that democracy and fascism in the star wars universe both act as ideas rather than as actions so mm. with this is true of the empire you know some the, the empire are fascistic but it doesn't actually, certainly in the old um, kind of uh, old Star Wars, certainly in the, in the films, it doesn't actually explain to you what that is. You know, it's fascism as something that you are rather than as something that you do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you are a fascist and you do fascist things rather than you just put on the uniform and that makes you a fascist. Mm -hmm. um, the same is true of democracy and of the republics. So, you, the, you know, there is constant stuff in the expanded universe and, you know, in Obi-Wan saying, you know, my allegiance is to the republic and to democracy. But you never actually, there is no participation in Star Wars democracy. You know, the ideal democracy is a democracy that people act, is something that people do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there is no, where are the elections? Where are the voters? Where is the representation? Where are the, where are the, where are the electorate? Where are the people? Um, these are things that just don't exist 
in the Star Wars democracy, in either the films or in the expanded universe. You know, Princess Leia ends up being the chief of state in a bunch of uh, books and, you know, is the, the senator for, for Alderaan. But you never get, there's never like an election campaign. There's never right. like, oh, you know, we've got the midterms or the local elections or, you know, people are going to their polling booths or anything like that. It's it's democracy as, as an idea of something that exists rather than something you actually have to participate in. And, mm -hmm. you know, the ideal democracy to my viewpoint the, you know the, the and the book talks about it a lot that the one of the criticisms of the the new republic in the expanded universe is that either the head of state is not powerful enough to do anything mm -hmm. or is so powerful that they're basically an emperor in waiting and there's no middle ground um and the way that you avoid those problems is by having people take part in it um mm -hmm. but there is no sense of democracy as a group of people participating in the betterment of society it's just here's a bunch of politicians we've got no idea how they got here regardless of how many times Borsk failure uh, who is when you pronounce his name like that is so aptly named um <laughs> has you know massively hindered the actions of the new republic it doesn't appear to matter because I, I don't know if he's getting re-elected or if he's there are no elections, but he's always there and nothing ever changes. Um, <laughs> that's that's the problem of Star Wars democracy is that no one's actually getting involved in it. <laughs> so then Star Wars storytelling basically kind of became democratic in its way by having more people write and the creation of the expanded universe and whatnot. So it seems like when you say George Lucas's default setting is Vietnam, like the, <laughs> the which I think is a very valid point, um, that we actually get a lot more, a, a lot richer history, even if it's a pop history, by the fact that we have not only an expanded group of writers participating in this, but also now we have multiple generations of writers who've been influenced by um, events in their lifetimes that were, you know, seminal for them in a way that Vietnam was seminal for Lucas. Yeah, absolutely. A, a, a wider pool of people to draw on with a wider pool of experiences is, is a really useful thing and a really interesting thing for Star Wars. Because whilst all of those people are, you know, coming from different backgrounds, like I'll give you an example. So I, as as part of like a, a really very happy offshoot of doing uh, the book that we're discussing, I got to co-write um, an official Star Wars book called Battles That Changed the Galaxy yes. with Jason Fry and Cole Horton and Amy Radcliffe. So what you've got there is four people of, you know, reasonably different ages, different backgrounds, Three of them live in America and have been exposed to American popular culture. I live in Britain and have also been exposed to American popular culture <laughs> as well as um, as well as my own. And we're all bringing different stuff. But because of the way that Star Wars works and everybody understands, you know, the rules of Star Wars, exactly as you said, you know, the Empire are the bad guys. Jedi do certain things. The Republic represents certain stuff is that we can bring those different backgrounds and bring it into Star Wars in a way that doesn't really disrupt the flow of of ideas and the flow of material because star wars is broad enough to encompass those different backgrounds and those different ideas but it's also stable enough that none of us are going to dramatically change the way that the whole world works you know i'm not going to rock up and go you know what i've decided that because i've been uh you know i've grown up in britain and we used to have an empire um that you know i am going to fundamentally change the way that the galactic empire exists but only in the pages that i'm writing the rest of you can do whatever the you know whatever you want you know it does it, you know it wouldn't work like that firstly the lucasfilm story group wouldn't have allowed that type of thing to go through but right. also because i know how the empire works mm -hmm. why would i pitch that you know it's not gonna it's gonna that's gonna be too disruptive but i can bring different stuff into it because because of the difference in, in background. And that's what all of the Star Wars authors or all of the people who are doing games or graphic novels or, you know, making the new films, they're bringing different historical or contemporary material or political material and implanting it into like a, into, you know, the, the, the host organization <laughs> that can adapt to it. Right, right. All right, that's going to do it for the first half of my conversation with Dr. Chris Kemshall, author of The History and Politics of Star Wars. And just as a reminder, I mentioned this in the podcast yesterday, but there is a 20% discount code if you go to routledge.com. That's the publisher of The History and Politics of Star Wars. And I'll have this linked 
and you know the code at the blog post for the show's episode at Star Wars 7x7's website. That's SW7x7.com and also in the show notes too. But R-O-U-T-L-E-D-G-E.com and the discount code is ASM07. Again, that'll be at the website and in the show notes as well. And that right there is going to do it for today's episode of the podcast. It just remains for me to say thank you so much for joining me for it as always. And may the force be with you wherever in the world you may be. Star Wars 7x7 is not endorsed or sponsored yet by Lucasfilm Limited, Disney, or 20th Century Fox and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Star Wars, the Star Wars logo, all names and pictures of Star Wars characters, vehicles, and any other Star Wars related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Lucasfilm Limited by their respective trademark and copyright holders. May the force be with them. All original content is copyright 2021 by Star Wars 7x7. We hope you love it.